Hey everybody, I got DC back today. We're uh, gonna talk about whatever's on the mind. I think what we have on the mind today is life insurance because I've been talking nonstop about life insurance. Both of us have been watching these videos from a variety of, um, I don't know what we'd call them. I don't wanna call them salesmen or salespeople because that seems to be like giving them too much credit. Uh, pushers, <laughs> there we go, there we go. Yeah, we've been watching a lot of life insurance pushers, and we've been trying to parse this information as best we can and kind of figure out what they're talking about. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to talk about that today and kind of go into it. So how you doing, man? I'm good. Uh, yeah, so I have watched a lot of videos lately. I've kind of <laughs> looked at, uh, you know, I've watched them, and then I've gone back to Excel and plugged in the numbers, and, you know, I've come up with a, a lot of conclusions. We'll see if we have the same ones. You and I have talked about it a little, but uh, I think we'll have some unique perspectives. So, yeah, we've had a lot, and the, you know the um, the the spreadsheet thing—that's a big deal, right? Like, it really bothers me that like you and I sit down, we put some numbers into a spreadsheet, and we're like, "All right, this makes the most sense," right? This is how I can calculate whether or not a real estate deal makes the most sense. I'll link to it around here somewhere. I, I have a video where I sat down and broke down every bit of the real estate and how I calculate all that information. I do the same thing for index funds, right? It like there, nobody does that in this space. And that's incredibly frustrating. It's like how much for each dollar I put in, what, what's that dollar doing? Right. And we don't know what we get these like really vague kind of answers. Um, I'll link to it again. The, the video I just did earlier this, or I guess it was last week. By the time this video gets gets released, it'll be last week. <laughs> but um, where he, like, they kept bragging about how it was like 9.5% and it turned out to be like 4%, right? So that's the kind of stuff that we got to know because we're trying to invest to maximize our growth over time. And I get and I understand this argument of like, well, okay, when you're old, you don't want to see your stuff dip because that could really kill your retirement right um but when you're young like we, we could care less about that in fact yeah. it's actually a huge benefit right because like over the course of this whole recession so far all these dips we've been buying like crazy if there's more dips coming which it looks like there might be by the federal reserve we're gonna be buying like crazy and we're gonna take all this sale purchasing that we made into the bear market that comes on the other side and we're gonna shoot off so we love that volatility Right, so tying up our money into something that's like not giving that to us just seems like a tremendous waste. So if we can't sit down and put it into Excel, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the the funny things where you look at videos and you see the difference in what people are selling. You know, I'll use Bigger Pockets as an example. Um, mm -hmm. They're a real estate blog for people that aren't familiar, but you go to a lot of Bigger Pockets early videos. And they spend a lot of time showing you, you know, hey, on a whiteboard, this is exactly how you invest in real estate. And this is why it works. And I, I still yep. remember one video where the guy drew a house and he kind of had a picture of a house and he started filling it in like, hey, this bottom portion is going to be your principal. And then the you know, top mm -hmm. portion is going to be appreciation. And then the next portion is going to be uh, depreciation. And he just explained like in the figure of a house how the whole real estate scheme works. Um, but I mean, that's visual and it helps you understand that it's actually plausible, uh, vice just making it up and saying things. So I think it'd be nice to watch a video where someone takes IUL or whole life and sticks it on Excel or on a whiteboard and actually explains how it works. And I've never seen that video. Have you? Nope. I mean, I did the best I could in mine. I, I kind of put the numbers in there. Um, people kind of poked holes in it and I was like, that's fine. You know, show me the guy who's given the correct version of the other side, right? Absolutely. Not just these, like, illustrations. I, I love how they're like, oh, yeah, like, we beat our illustration. <laughs> well, who cares if you beat your illustration? Yeah. Right? That so, CPA <laughs> could have had, like, 1.5 million, and he ended up having 650, right? Yeah. So, that's so like what? You beat the illustration. That's like if you uh, if you were betting on a NASCAR race, and the bet you placed was that, you know, the driver of number 12 doesn't die. And then he crashes and he's in the hospital, but he's not dead. And you're like, see, I got it right. <laughs> That's terrible. I don't, yeah, I don't right. understand it. Yeah. So but then at the I mean, same time, you're trying to make everyone think that you bet on the guy winning. Right? Absolutely. Like, I bet on the guy to win. I made big money and he didn't die. And you're like, oh, well, that doesn't yeah. really go. <laughs> 
No, so I think it's funny. The illustrations are probably the best part of this. And it's kind of scary because the illustrations, uh, they do have some legal requirements where they have to at least mm -hmm. aim to be factual. And based on you and I's research, I think for the most part, illustrations are pretty accurate. Um, I mean, they're horribly accurate in the way that they're going to under return the market by a long shot and you're going to lose money over, I mean, anything over five years and you're just getting killed. So I think they are accurate in that respect. Would you agree? Oh yeah. I mean, they, they do sit down I mean, the, the, um, the video we just did, or we just, um, did the reaction to the guys like, you know, oh yeah, there's $9,000 in fees here. Like who can pay $9,000 in fees? Like what? And he's like, oh, the fees are decreasing. Well, big freaking whoop. That's like a whole, yeah. you know, fa two week family trip to like Disneyland or something that you're paying to these guys just to undercut Absolutely. the market. Why? Yeah, and then when they explain in the videos, you know, they're like, hey, keep in mind when you start the policy, the first couple of years are going to be in the negative. So if you put 50 grand in, you might only have 30 grand in cash value. Well, a mm -hmm. logical person would say, where's my 20 grand? At least. I mean, if you put yeah. 50 grand in over three years, you'd expect, I mean, at least 55, 60 with interest, right? Instead, you have yep. 30. I mean, oh, you again, that's... fund the life insurance. You're like... You have to fund the life insurance and you have to fund the salesman commission, which is, or the salesperson commission, which is where yep. the sales part really does come into play. At the end of the day, they're selling a product and there's a commission on the backside for that. Yeah, definitely. I want to I wanna kind of complain about some of the mechanics um, coming up, but right now... I kind of want to tell people, um, I kind of want to lead everyone to why, like where, why we're in this conversation to begin with, right? And, and give everyone kind of like a background as to what we're doing. So the whole point of Wealthy Idiots, I'm going way back. The whole point of Wealthy Idiots, the reason you and I got together, and I, this was somewhat intentional and somewhat non-intentional. We just kind of stumbled upon each other at some point. I mean, we knew each other for a long time, right? But we kind of yep. stumbled upon that we were both really into this finance stuff at some point. And I think that I undercredit the amount of value that I get bouncing ideas off of you, sending stuff your direction. You do the same. You're like, what about this? What if we did this? Right. I, um, I hit you up sometimes and be like, I got this really dumb idea or it's genius. Yeah, you, you know, you, you let me know where I'm missing. Week, so. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so here's some way. interesting stuff. And we're going to talk uh, about it at some point here. I'm going to, we're absolutely. not going to talk about it today. We got to, we still have to round some, uh, you know, some corners well, think, out before we can kind of, we can segue into it for next time. Yeah, that's true. And then maybe, yeah, we'll, yeah, give maybe it, next we'll give time a, we get together, we'll give a we'll teaser it for sure. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, stick around to the end of the episode. We'll get to the teaser at the end. So that way you guys know. Um, and you know, we bounce stuff, uh, ideas off of each other. Well, like I ran into a whole life. Um, I wouldn't say salesperson cause I, I didn't run into anyone in particular. Somehow I got the concept. I don't remember where it was from. And I was trying to figure out like, you know, there's, there's way too many people saying that this is like something that we should be doing. Right. And I'm like, okay, well, so many people are saying that, like, where's the benefit? And then Dave Ramsey is telling us definitely don't do anything with whole life. And because yep. of my inclination to be like, you know, well, if Dave Ramsey says not to do it, then it must be good. <laughs> like, Right? Yeah, because that's definitely. how I feel on all the real estate stuff. I'm like, Dave Ramsey tells me <laughs> not to buy real estate with credit, so I'm going to go do it. Right. Like, <laughs> I feel that way about that. So I like kind of set out to prove Dave Ramsey wrong. Like, OK, there, there must be a place for this whole life concept or, you know, index universal life or at the time it was whole life. That's what I was looking at. And I was trying to figure out where is the place? You know, how does it fit? And so you and I went back and forth the whole bunch and I was like, okay, I could kind of see the argument people are making, but I'm having a hard time figuring out what the actual use case is. Like where does it fit? Not only where does it fit in a portfolio, but like how would you use it to like be successful? And I think the best argument somebody made was you use this as like your staging grounds for purchasing other kinds of investments. So instead of hanging on to cash in order to purchase things, because, you know, there's no real good place to put cash that has a good return. Yep. So their argument was like, okay, if you can't put it in a savings account and, re and get any kind of real return, put it in whole life, you're guaranteed like two, three, four percent or something after all the fees that you're paying. Um, and that's better than a savings account. And so I kind of bought into that. I was like, okay, you know, better than a savings account, I can use it as kind of a staging grounds for my real estate plans. 
right? And then I started looking at illustrations and like you pointed out, some of the illustrations were showing like it took a long time to get to the point where you had any value that was worth anything. So I'm like, well, I don't want to tie my money up into some insurance company when I'm trying to buy real estate right now, right? Like, and I understand the concept of compounding interest. I understand that the dollar I invest now is so much more impactful than the dollar I invest next year or 10 years from now. So I'm like, I got to make purchases today. So if I start giving fees over to this whole life company, I'm going to lose all that, right? And I kind of waddled back and forth on that for a while. Um, And then I thought, okay, maybe emergency fund is the way to go with that because you have to have cash somewhere. I ultimately landed on um, no, you know, this is a totally different argument for a different time, but I landed on no emergency fund, go all into the market, either real estate, index funds, whatever, you know, just suck up the volatility as best I can. And worst case scenarios, I'll take loans out just in general. It could be against assets, could be against real estate, whatever, in order to come up with cash if I absolutely needed to. Because as it turns out, your assets can grow at a faster rate than the interest on a loan, right? So it's possible to still have an emergency fund in the concept of a loan. And the only reason I hadn't thought about that prior was because Dave Ramsey told me not to think about it that way. So I never did, right? So once I landed on that concept, which you were already on (laughs) to your credit, (laughs) you you were telling me from the beginning, like, dude, just invest money don't trip and i was like nah there's got to be a reason for this whole life it's got to be there's got to be something you brought a you brought a different benefit though um i think you started looking at it from a different perspective which is why do the insurance companies think this is like why is it profitable which is a good question i think when you started digging down the path of why do the insurance companies like this so much and i I don't think it's just the sales commissions that's not the reason because a lot of that is going to the agent not the insurance company um, mm-hmm. And then when you started figuring out like, hey, the insurance company is almost treating it like a bet and they're buying put options on the downside protection of this. So they're basically taking a whole bunch of your money, buying put options. And then if the market crashes, they have a bunch of money to give you and say, hey, look, you made zero percent, even though the market lost 22 percent. So the no one tells you is the insurance company hit a home run. I mean, that's the other side of that. Um, mm-hmm. If the market loses 22 percent, they probably crushed all those puts. So, oh yeah, you know, it's when you start talking about the mechanics, you can start applying this to your everyday life with how do you borrow money, um, whether it be a HELOC or a line of credit or, I mean, there's all kinds of things. So, and that's something we'll talk about later, but I think you really digging into the mechanics of why these things exist kind of showed us more than just the initial face value of it. Yeah, definitely. That's what I wanted to go into next is because, you know, that part, um, well, you know, to, to summarize what, to just finish up what we were just saying is, um, I just want the audience to know, like, I didn't come at this from the perspective of like, this is obviously wrong. Let me prove it. I definitely tried hard to yep. figure out how to make this thing work and to fit it in my strategy. And I just couldn't do it. And yep. then the more that I learned, the less that that became true. Right. So I definitely tried my best to come at it from a good perspective. Um, but the second perspective, like you were saying, I started to look at it as like, okay, let me pretend like I'm the one collecting the money. How does this work for me? Right. Because, you know, you're advertising essentially like, um, that Doug Andrew guy, right? Like that's the guy I've been reviewing recently and yep. watching because he's just so like flamboyantly outrageous with his claims. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I don't, someone from my work said like, never trust a guy with two first names. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Oh, like I remember hearing that before that, that cracked me up. But um, yeah, I started to think about it the other way around. And w- the first thing that you got to think of is for a whole life, universal life, any life insurance where they're going to cover you until the day that you die, regardless of when you die, that means 100% of the time they're going to be paying out. Right? Like you you can't get around that. It's either either you lose big because your policy collapsed or your policy made it to the end of your life and the insurance company pays out. Right? And insurance is not designed in a way where the thing is guaranteed at the end. It's the whole point is like a pool of people are paying into something and hopefully only a few people actually have to use <laughs> that thing. Right? It's why like health insurance, we end up paying way more in health insurance than we use when we're young. And then that kind of like flips the other direction when you get old. That's the whole concept, right? And term life kind of does that process too. It's like, hey, look, we're betting on that most of you won't need this, right? But the few of you who do, will be able to afford to pay that out. 
until the time frame ends. And that's the whole bet the insurance company is making. So if the insurance company is pretty much guaranteeing a payout at the end, you have to start from the premise of like, you're basically paying that amount into the insurance company at some point. I mean, and you know, IUL people don't even dispute that. They're like, well, of course, right? Because as the insurance, as, as your cash value starts to approach that death benefit amount, right? Then the insurance almost goes away, right? There's almost mm-hmm. no insurance anymore. So essentially you yep. paid for term life insurance. <laughs> with, and outran like, the term. <laughs> Ten thousand plus dollars per year higher than yep. what term life insurance actually costs. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's not expensive as a rule. So that's the yeah, that's the first you know mechanic hole on that one. Do you have a comment on that well, one? And so also, I mean, you got to remember, insurance companies pay actuaries a lot of money to you know to chart and create algorithms on what the likelihood of a loss or a, a gain is in this case. So mm-hmm. if the insurance company is giving you a policy, I don't care what they call it. You can call it health insurance, car insurance, homeowners insurance. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want. But if the insurance company is writing the policy to you, they're writing it because it's already tilted to them. So that's the only reason they're in business yep. is to make money on the policies. So, you know, if they write you, let's go with a, let's just say an umbrella insurance policy. So they write you umbrella insurance that says, you know, if you get sued as a result of one of your insured products, liability, you know, we'll cover you up to $2 million. They're betting that they'll never pay that $2 million because either A, they'll settle for less or B, you'll just carry the insurance for a hundred years and never get sued like most people who never get sued. So they, you know, they've done the research. They know what the numbers are. So, you know, when you talk about IUL or whole life or um, any of the other ones that have different acronyms that I can't remember, I mean, it's the same principle. They're, they're only taking that risk in the very front end in this case. So um, I have a, can I pull up that example I have? I actually pulled that illustration and we can kind of talk through it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because I pulled a whole life illustration uh, about a week ago and I just found it. All right, so we'll take a look at this real quick. I think it's, uh, you see that? Uh, yes, now I do. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see it right out of the gate. So, obviously, uh, the annual outlay for the buyer, in this case, if I'm buying this insurance from the company, which I'm not going to name, um, I mean, right out of the gate, I'm paying 12645 a year just to have this coverage. And at the end of year one, I have 3785 in cash value. And the insurance company has a death benefit for me of 505000 So at this point, you would say the insurance company is the most exposed they're going to be. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And also I, I mean, they're looking there. Absolutely. So they're looking at me like a 35-year-old male, and they're saying, hey, we're betting this guy's not going to die, and we're going to get his cash value high enough to where he basically outruns this life insurance. And you can see as you go down to, let's say, year 15, the Cumulative net outlay is now one hundred and ninety thousand, um, and you have six hundred and fifty-one thousand in insurance. So, if you do the math on this one, I think it came out to about three point two percent real return. So, mm-hmm. if you would have bought term and then just invested in the stock market, I can't tell you the number, but you'd have a lot more than uh, what is it, two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars. Yeah, it's like ten point five percent averaged. Yeah, right, so uh, it's in the stock market. It's just bad, but you can see from the chart, as that cash value goes up, the insurance company risk goes lower and lower. So, and that's, that's kind of the platform they base this off of. They're, they're pretty much using the data they know from death statistics and life expectancy and all of that to create these policies and eventually make them very profitable for themselves. So, well, I mean, look at like you put in $202,000 in year 16. And your value is 240 and it's not really 240, right? Cause I point this out in one of the show, one of the episodes that I did, it's, it's 240 if you don't take it out. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it, the net surrender value is the value that banks use because they understand that like the actual cash value is funny money. There's nothing in there that guarantees that that money is actually there right? The money that the bank can get, like when the bank buys health, uh, life insurance, which we can talk about too, but um, is the net surrender value. Cause that's the value minus the pen- penalties and fees for canceling this policy. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's crazy when you think about it because you're talking about, you know, they always use the tax advantage of these accounts. And this is probably what kills me the most because they always talk about how tax advantage these are. 
The only reason they're saying that is if you actually take loans against that net cash value. So like if we look at year 15, the net cash value is $216,000. So if you take a loan against that, you're technically never realizing a gain on any of your money. You pay interest, you pay it back, it's considered a loan. It's just like borrowing on a HELOC, a yeah. uh, home equity line of credit. So with that being said, if you actually go and try to pull that, I don't know why it stopped sharing. Anyways, um, if okay. you we went could, ahead and- We could stop that? sharing now if you want. We can stop okay. sharing if you want. We can go back. Yeah, so if you went ahead and tried to pull that money and all of it, you're going to end up paying taxes on that entire gain that you have, yeah. which there is a gain there. It's not huge, but you're going to pay taxes on that gain. So the tax-free argument really kind of ends at uh, the point where you say, I'm going to take my net surrender value and cash it out. And then that whole tax-free myth, I mean, it gets flushed down the toilet. Yep. So. Yeah, because the, the amount of money that's going to hit your bank account is the dollar amount after the surrender fees, the cancellation fees, all that stuff. Yep. Then the IRS is going to come asking for their capital gains in that too. And, right? what and surrender granted, fees? it won't be a lot because you will not have made very much, if any money. <laughs> so it's not like no. you're going to pay a bucket ton of taxes, <laughs> but you will pay yeah, taxes. Yeah, now what, surrender, surrender fees stick around for, I think, 10 years is normal. Is that what I, I've been reading? Yeah, I think it's ten. The first ten years or something. The there's the surrender fee. Yep. On that policy, I, but it depends. I, like I don't. I don't want. I, I know that's true for Index Universal. I don't know if that's true for Whole Life. I don't want to mix it these is. two up because yeah, it's confusing. Yeah. So full disclosure, that was a Whole Life policy we just showed you. Yeah. Um, you'll see, you know, nominal differences between a Whole Life and an IUL policy. If you want us to debate uh, which one's better, we're not going to have that debate because we think they're both clunkers. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I've been going after IUL like super hard, and then I get your text messages. You're going after Whole Life super hard. <laughs> so like, if we talk past each other a few times here, you can let us know in the comments. But you know, we're admitting our fault yeah. on this one. <laughs> Absolutely. And just to give you a main difference uh, with whole life, typically the uh, your money in a whole life policy is not invested in index funds. So it's invested in securities, mm -hmm. but you don't see what the whole life insurance invests those in. Um, as far mm -hmm. as IUL, the insurance company tells you they're openly investing in the stock market, they're buying options, things like that. And mm -hmm. then they're giving you a piece of yeah. that return. So that's, that's kind of the difference in mechanism. How it actually works behind the scenes, I don't think we're going to get the insurance companies to cough up specific numbers, but uh, that's our best guess at this point. So No. I think you're spot on. it With IUL, I think it's probably what they're doing is they're, uh, they're hedging their bets by putting a bunch of puts up against your options, right? So they're, they're taking – what they do is they buy bonds. They take the interest from the bonds, and they use that interest in order to buy options against a particular index, Right. And then if it's successful, well, then they make money, they put it into your account. And if it's successful at, you know, if the cap is 12%, well, if it's successful at 25%, then you get the 12, they get the other uh, 13%, that goes into their account. But they if charge you fees too. Yes. Yeah, they'll charge you fees for that. And yep. then if, because uh, these, these caps have fees on them, these investment strategies have fees on them, and then they're going to hedge their bets by putting puts against probably the same exact thing. So that way, if they lose the entire thing, the entire interest, they'll just tell you like, sorry, we lost your interest. You get zero. You know, obviously we're still going to charge you fees. So too bad for that. And also no, we're going to make three. a little bit of money off these puts over here, you know, because we hedged our bets against you. Yep. Right. That's a hundred percent what's happening. Right. But yeah, yeah, so the mechanics, you know, Oh, sorry, go ahead. No. So I just, uh, I mean, one of the, you gave an example of someone who explained, you know, it's like a holding place for money, which was an interesting mm -hmm. perspective. But last week you sent me a video and it was a guy that kind of went with a different approach and he admitted like, Hey, I sell IUL. That's my job. And I'm never telling people it's a stock market product. Instead, he says it's a bond product. So basically mm -hmm. if you want to buy IUL, you should buy it as a fixed income holding and it has a very specific purpose and you want to fill that lower allocation of bonds in your account. And when you and I started talking about it, we, I get it. He's being at least honest because it's a more honest mm -hmm. take than the alternative, but it's almost worse because if you're telling a 25 year old, they should be max funding in indexed universal life and putting it, you know, 80% of their money into bonds. I mean, that's a worse decision than if it was being sold as a stock market product. So, I mean, at 25 yeah, years right. old, you should not be thinking about bonds and that's, yeah, it just 100%. further kills the argument. So. Yeah. yeah. Buy, buy the, you want the volatility. You want the dips. Buy the dips. Right? 
Uh, oh, 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 I know what I was going to say. So like, you were talking about the tax part, and the tax part drives me nuts. Is calling this whole thing tax free is super dishonest. Someone called me out yep. for being dishonest, saying that you pay taxes because they're like, well, there's a strategy for taking out the money without paying taxes. So saying that it's a taxable account is a little bit dishonest. And then I, I was thinking about that and that was rubbing me the wrong way. And later that day I was like, wait, you could take out a loan against a taxable brokerage account, right? And you could use that loan. However you want that loan is not taxed, right? It's essentially the same thing. And the account is actually called a taxable brokerage account. Right. Yep. So like, what if I got online and I started talking about this tax free strategy where you put all your money in a taxable brokerage account? Do you think everybody would be like, oh, yeah, I see how that's obvious. No, of course not. They'd be like, well, the, the account's called a taxable brokerage account. Exactly. Well, let's start calling IUL a taxable indexed universal life policy. Because that's what it right? is. Or whole life, a taxable whole life policy. Right. And then, OK, yeah, there, you can go around, you know, some weird strategy to try and get your cash out without paying anything. But. Well, that doesn't suddenly so, make it a not taxed account. And and like anything else, I'm going to bring this back to real estate because there's so many examples of how this works. Mm -hmm. So let's say I buy a house uh, for $100,000. Let's just go back five years when you could actually do that. Um, I buy a house for $100,000 <laughs> and in three years, that house is worth $200,000. So easy math. We'll say my 100000 basis, 200000 sales price. I'm going to have roughly a 100000 gain. Obviously, there's mm -hmm. going to be real estate fees and transaction costs in there. Let's just call it 100 for simple math. So if I don't want to pay tax on that 100 grand, instead of selling the house, I could refinance and pull the equity out, in which case I would now have a not taxable home sale that I didn't really sell the home, but I just refinanced it and paid myself back. It's the yep. same concept. So, you know, nothing they're doing with Index Universal Life or Whole Life or Universal Indexed Whole Life Incorporated Squared is going to be any different. It's all the same no. theory we've been using forever and it's stuff we've been talking about. And it's kind of the anti-Dave Ramsey theory of leveraging debt. They're just doing mm -hmm. it with a lot of extra steps and fees. And I think that's where it gets lost in so many ways. Uh, so many people. Yeah. Paying bucket tons of commission to try and accomplish that goal. Yeah, and, right. and I think one of the things, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that really drives me nuts about this product is it is so targeted to poor people. And that is the worst part because on one hand, you have salesmen that are saying, hey, this is the strategy the rich use. And so if you're saying this is the strategy <laughs> the rich use, that doesn't automatically mean it applies to the poor. I mean, so yeah, you know, right. rich people pay CPA firms hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably sometimes even millions to manage their taxes in order to not pay the IRS a ton of money. Should I go pay a CPA firm a hundred grand? No. So the, the same principles don't apply. That's what rich people are so, doing. Absolutely, but uh, I don't have enough money to pay a hundred grand just to try to save two grand on the IRS. So you have to scale some yep. of this stuff. So when you make the argument, hey, this is the, the same thing rich people are doing, and then you turn around and try to sell it to a poor person, it, right out of the gate, it's slimy. And I think that's part of the reason why these uh, sales reps leave a bad taste in people's mouth because it's dishonest. Um, I mean, it really just, it doesn't sit well with people. And I think trying to sell a bad financial product to poor people is a good way to just perpetuate further poorness and further poverty. I, I just don't like it. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and, um, oh man, what was I going to say? Blinked out. You are getting old. Yeah, I'm I'm getting old. Yeah, you're only like three years behind me. You'll get there. Yeah, it's still three years. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's super frustrating, man. Because you're absolutely right, and your example is absolutely right. Like this last year, um, I bought a, or this last month, right? I bought a house. We're flipping it right now. We're putting it on Airbnb. Um, my guy's in there redoing an entire bathroom, the master bathroom. It's gonna look super slick, right? So. Do, do, like, do, do we just go like, oh, since I'm doing that, you should also do it because that's what we're doing. So you should replicate it. Right. Of course not. Right. Nope. Whatever it is that you're doing, you have to do at scale to whatever it is that you're capable of doing. And if every dollar you have. So like one of the court cases, which is interesting, one of the court cases against um, I don't know if it was against Doug Andrew or his son. I think it was against his son. Right. I want to be very careful Wait what I say because. So are you saying like multiple members of the family have been sued? Never mind. Just continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, may you know, I may or may not be saying that. I don't know. It's yeah, so form. I think it was against his son. Whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I want to be careful what I say. I don't want to get sued for like claiming something that isn't true. So I'm I'm being very careful. The claimant was a man who was making like sixty k a year in his pension. He was already retired. They sold him a policy that was costing him like fifty five thousand dollars a year. Right, that was his argument. I don't know if that turned out to be true. I don't know what the what the stuff was about that. But like looking at some of these policies that are being sold, they're like tens of thousands of dollars a year, and they're selling them to people like guaranteed retirement income. And there's nothing guaranteed about any of this stuff, right? And yeah. I, I thought it was super interesting how like you know their examples. And I started going through some more examples. Their examples are like people from 2009 to today. They're like, look at how successful IUL is between 2009 and today. And today was like 2021 in the, you know, when they filmed these things, like everything yeah. was successful between 2009 and today, everything. Right. So it's just yeah. a matter of how successful was it Correct. now? How will this thing weather the storm? Right. And one of the things, the whole life stuff, and I've, I've been trying to poke people to get an answer for this one and I don't get a good one is the loans that you take out. They're not fixed rate loans, right? They're, they're, they're loans that change rates based off of what the fed rate is and they're they have an index against the fed rate right and then that's how they're determining what the loan is all right so if you're guaranteed let's pretend that these guys aren't lying and you're getting a guaranteed like five percent return or something like that what if these interest rates go up to six what's their strategy look like this is the first time we've seen interest rate hikes like this since what the 80s Right. Yep. So we don't know how this is going to like IUL is going to handle this. We have no idea. I have a feeling it's not going to be good, though. Yeah. So that, that's an interesting perspective is that uh, for, so you and I both talk about this. We hate cherry picking timelines. And it's funny because we have conversations <laughs> about how can we make our data more real? And I yeah. think we've kind of talked about how it's hard to even take the last 40 years of the S&P 500 because you're grabbing such a violent chunk of success from <laughs> 2010 until 2021. So you're talking about mm -hmm. 11 years of just gains upon gains. So, you know, if you ever follow the Wall Street Bets Forum, I kind of followed it mm -hmm. around the, the big wave during 2020, and everybody on Wall Street Bets was making money. I mean, you could buy the trashiest company out there and you were killing it. And then as 2021 and 2022 rolled around, everyone started tanking. So these guys that had gone from a hundred grand to a million went to like $20 and now they couldn't pay their tax bill. So it's, yep. I mean, you could cherry pick all the timelines you want. That doesn't make you right. That makes you, you know, you're selling a specific chunk of time that's not guaranteed to happen again. Um, yeah. And that's why we talk about, you know, stock market does average 10.6% historically, but the key is how do those individual time periods act? So 10.6 average is one thing, but if you mm -hmm. have three years of consecutive 20% losses, that is a bad three years. So how do you quantify that? And that's kind of the piece yeah. you and I go back and forth with is how do we capture, you know, the really hard times versus the really good times, vice just pulling an average of all of them, which is kind of unrealistic. So, yeah, absolutely. Right. And I don't remember if, or I don't know if you saw that interview I did with Carl Dom a few weeks ago. Um, he's that day trader guy that yep. like he goes and reviews day trader and courses and like ranks them and everything and destroys them. Um, he, he advertises his annual returns are like 15%, right? Which is a realistic number just so that it you is. all know anything above that starts to get unrealistic. If they're offering 1% a day, even 1% a week is, what, is what it's was, not realistic. What was it? I texted you about the guy that's offering 2000% returns. And I sent you a text that said, if, if you double a penny every day for 31 days, you have $10.5 yep. million. I mean, yeah. that's real. So if you think about someone saying 2,000% returns, they should be as wealthy as Warren Buffett or, I, yeah, right? I mean, they should be, they should be loaded. <laughs> and I said that to him too. I was like, you know, I, I talked to a guy who was promising crazy returns and I was like, this isn't real. I know you're not real. You're, you'd be richer than Warren Buffett is in a year. Why are you selling courses like why would you do that and carl's response was like yeah no, none of that stuff is real they're all just giving you their best versions and he said that the biggest problem that people have in these courses is that they don't they're they don't have a strategy for the different types of markets right he was saying that there's a bear market 
a bull market, a sideways market, but he said that when there's a bear market, it could be a, a total market crash or it could be a slow grind downwards. And we've been seeing this slow grind downwards for a while. And we're also seeing a whole lot of day trader people just kind of disappear because they have yep. no strategy, right? Correct. Everybody was making money when it goes up. It's now that determines whether or not your strategy is real. So I'm interested to see how things like IUL, like I have no doubt whole life will make it, right? IUL didn't start until like 97, right? So it made it through a couple of crashes like the 2008 crash and stuff, but it still was a baby at that point. Yeah, yep. it didn't start seeing major sales into IUL until 2009 when it was really easy to convince people like, hey, look, this doesn't have a floor. And you saw what happened to people who didn't have the, like a floor, right? So yep. you should get this IUL policy. It has a floor and people bought into that. And so like sales spiked in 2009. Well, all the data from 2009 to today looks great. So definitely. You know, we'll see yeah, what happens. So when you, and I want to, I want to back up a little bit. I meant to say this earlier, and I forgot. You know, we talk about having disagreements about this, and you, you can watch a whole life guy and a universal life guy completely destroy each other, and you and I are sitting <laughs> over here like, holy cow, guys, you're selling the same garbage. Why are you fighting? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's great. But uh, I want to tell everyone, like, hey, uh, AJ and I don't agree on everything either. When he first said he was going to research universal life, I was like, you're crazy. Don't even bother. Like, I already <laughs> made my mind up. So I completely shot him down from the beginning. I actually started questioning our partnership for a little bit. And then, you know, like I, <laughs> I knew he would, he started really seeing the facts that are kind of behind the curtain. Um, you know, but with that being said, there's, there's all kinds of things we disagree on. And I just want to make sure everyone knows, like, there's a lot of talk that should be occurring regarding personal finance. So when we say these things, we're trying not to be definite either, because you could have a different perspective on this. And you know, if you're one of those watchers out there that has an idea on IUL that we haven't heard, please send it to us. I mean, we'd like to have you on the show. If you think you can justify what the numbers do, uh, we would certainly love to hear it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of our bigger disagreements is just, you know, not disagreements, but our difference in investing strategy. So, you know, you're doing a lot of Airbnb stuff mm -hmm. and I'm just index funding until death. I mean, so we're both <laughs> taking completely different paths. And I think at the end of the day, we end up in the exact same place. So that doesn't make either path wrong. It just shows there's different ways to do this. Yeah, absolutely. And I talked about that recently too. Like the real estate one takes more effort. You get higher returns, but there's yep. more effort involved. And I'm willing to do that effort. I love it. I have a blast. Not everyone can do that. Whereas index funds are probably one of the best things that you can do. One of the, and one of the things I did in my recent, and I'll, I'll link to it. It's the one where I said like, well, how to invest my 11 K a month or something. It was a fan question. Um, and I answered the question, like you can go and look at how things compared to each other over the course of the last like 30 years. Right. And index funds, you know, I'm not telling you to go buy them, I'm not telling the audience to go buy them. You guys do what you want. You do your research. In my research, it looks like index funds have the most return for the most passive effort, right? Like bar none. Like I, I can't find anything else that has like the same amount. I'm not a huge fan of mutual funds, mostly because I also, I have like a, like a resistance to people touching stuff right? Like I already think that you're trying to scam me. So I don't need you to like take a percentage to try and like guess. Yeah. Right? And so, I'm not okay with that. Just to clarify. So when you're talking about mutual funds, you're talking about actively managed ones. So yeah, yeah, correct. Um, you can find a, you can find an index fund in a mutual fund form. Yes. Correct. Uh, Sorry, like yeah. VTSAX at Vanguard would be an example. Um, but when we're talking about index funds, you know, we're talking about funds that track an index. So in other words, the managers of that fund aren't trading against their ideals. They're basically trying to mimic a specific index. So if it's an S&P 500 index fund, they take the makeup of the S&P 500 and they try to duplicate it and then yep. give you the same returns the market gets. And that's really the, the basis of the whole index fund movement. And then in doing that, they try to minimize taxes and fees. So as an investor, you get more of your money, which is great. I mean, that's the best thing I've ever heard. Exactly. Right. And you know, for an actively managed mutual fund, you may be able to pull above a 10 and a half, but it's rare and they struggle to get to that, right? And very little anything pulls a 10 and a half. I mean, like the fact that you could just put your money into something and never have to look at it, right? And it's producing an average of 10 and a half is, is incredible. There's nothing yep. else that exists like that, 
right? So yeah, I love real estate because I know I could get like 20 plus percent returns on real estate, but I got to go put effort into that. I got to, I fly down there. I got to account for stuff. I talk to a million people, right? We have to deal with issues. Like, um, we had a tree fall on my house recently. So we had to deal with that. We didn't have people in there while the tree was on the house because we didn't know if the roof had a leak in it. So you get to deal with all that stuff you don't have to deal with with index funds. And then, yeah, I'm probably like, you know, I I, don't, I just sent you the chart. Over 50% of my portfolio is in real estate. And then the other major yep. chunk is I'm working on building index funds. And my 401k is all in index funds. So if you count those two together, they're pretty large. Yeah, and so one of the differences with us is you can generate down payments for real estate a little bit quicker than I can. Mm-hmm. So in your case, you're saying, hey, I can turn down payments into real property, which is a great, a great way to invest. For me, the time frame of saving down payments for real property, it's hard to save those in non-cash assets. So basically, if I put yeah. a bunch of money in the stock market and then I find a property I want to buy, now I have to sell all those stocks, which I don't like doing. So instead, I've kind of just dedicated myself to the index funds and I want to play the long game, i.e. 20, 30 more years of just doing that. So mm-hmm. as you can see, there's a lot of different ways you can cut this. And there's a lot of personal reasons on why people do certain things. Definitely. 100%. So before we close out, I, I wanted to go like one more pattern here real quick yep. in people's phases of life, right? So yep. in your first phase of life, um, you don't need life insurance, right? What, so what, are, you, what no, are you using life no insurance No marriage, for? no kids. Yeah. You have nobody depending on you, right? Your parents like or you're probably still mooching off of them up until 26. You're, you're still on their health. Oh, excuse me. You're still on their health insurance. So like, yeah, you, you don't need life insurance for anything. I've never personally had life insurance. Not once. I just didn't care. Right. The next thing yep. is, and the, the next bit is like, yeah, you know, now that I have generated people that I love and I, <laughs> by generated, I mean, had kids and found a wife. And uh, now I want to give something to them. So I look at my portfolio and I'm like, okay, well, how much do I think they need? You know, and my portfolio exceeds that amount, right? Already, like now. I don't need to worry about like anything else. I know that I can, my wife gets everything tax-free. We can give up to like 12 million uh, tax-free for federal. um, And then some states have different stuff, but you know, for federal up to 12 million per kid and be tax-free. We don't have to worry about that stuff, right? Because I'm not rich enough to care. So covering them, if I was to die, is already done. The only exception is in this stage of my life, I I would say that for most people, this is probably late 20s to early 40s. This is the stage where you're trying to figure stuff out. If you don't have enough money yet in investments, that's what term life insurance is for, right? So if you have like 100 grand saved, you want to make sure that they have 500 grand when you die, go get a 400 grand policy to make up the difference. Yep. It's cheap, right? The next thing is you got to invest like crazy, right? So that's, there's no excuses here. This is the part where, you know, they, they really sell, they really destroy people on. They're like, you know, oh, well, people aren't investing. People aren't saving. So if we force them to do it by making a whole life policy, <laughs> then they'll actually have more returns. And when they say that, they're not entirely wrong. And that's on the person. Like instead of having someone force you to invest, start doing it. Just go ham on that stuff. Right. Between like 20, you, you should be like house hacking, putting stuff into index funds all the way until you retire. You should be going hard because you need to take advantage of every recession, every vol- uh, volatile moment. You need to get in there as hard as you possibly can. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, new college graduates are the real ones where this needs to be pounded into. I mean, you're talking mm-hmm. about a kid that graduates college at 22 years old. And it's just you, someone that has a fairly successful degree program. So they're an accountant or they're going to be an engineer, um, you know, something, a nurse, something like that, where you're guaranteed a good starting salary. If you're getting a $65,000, $70,000 job offer, you've never made that kind of money. So that is the time to, instead of taking 70 grand and spending it, you should save 20 and spend 50 yep. because it's the easiest time to do it. And you and I both know you can still live off 50 grand a year. I'm not saying you're going to be buying Porsches and Ferraris, but you can do it. So if you set that savings trend early and you just get in the habit of constantly saving, by the time you're 30, it's going to look really good. And you're going to know exactly why you did it and what it's going to lead to. Oh, absolutely. Like when I, when I first got in my first engineering job, 
my salary was really low because it was an introductory salary, junior developer, trial period, all that stuff, right? Yep. Um, I was saving uh, over 20% because I was also doing the um, employee stock purchase plan. You know, I was doing as much as I could to not see money in my account because I knew if I saw it in my account, I'd spend it. Bingo. Right? That style of living is what I maintained up until I got married. So every year I went from junior developer to just mid-level engineer to senior engineer to manager all in like a, what was like an eight year time frame, right? And every single time that that occurred, uh, ex- with the exception of when I got married, because obviously now I got more yep. stuff going on, but I, I didn't inflate my lifestyle once. I have the exact same car I had before I even got that job, right? And the purpose of that is like every dollar I was getting as an increase was getting invested. I was going harder and harder because I knew every dollar I invested was that much more where I could make sure that my daughter was taken care of, right? If anything ever did happen to me, she would be fine. And then now I'm using it for this whole crew, right? I got to make sure that my whole family is taken care of if anything goes wrong, right? So that's the intensity that you have to be investing. And if you do that, you don't pull your money out when you're young, right? You're going to get to the point where your family will have enough to live off of if something happened to you where you don't need insurance, And it's going to grow until your retirement at a much higher rate. You will have so much more money by the time you get to retirement than anybody doing this life plan, this life insurance plan. So the last phase of life or comment on that. And then we'll, we'll talk about the last phase. Yeah. And you're, you're spot on. So same thing for me. Uh, I think since roughly 2013, my paycheck hasn't changed one bit. So I've made more money. However, Mm -hmm. the, amount that ends up in my paycheck is roughly exactly the same because all the time I get that money, the pay raises, the increases, the cost of living, it just goes towards savings. So my paycheck stays the same. Um, and that's a good way to you know baseline yourself to where you're not constantly increasing your cost of living, trying to keep up with the Joneses or whoever the heck mm-hmm. lives next door to you. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> just you know do your own thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like go hard at it. This yep. is the time to go hard. Then when you get to that retirement stage, that's the stage you probably want some more stability. That's the stage you're going to be withdrawing, right? But now that we've built so much more equity than anybody with an index life or whole life, you're going to have so much more that taxes are really not even a concern anymore, right? Like the CPA example, the market could drop 50% and he still wouldn't have the amount of money that he had in his IUL account, right? So like... Market volatility is no longer a concern anymore, right? So, like, you know, I I understand when people say, like, invest 15%. I would say double it. Go 30%. Spend the rest of your life going 30%, right? Because then you make sure that when you hit retirement, not only can you be comfortable, there are, there are lots of strategies to make sure that you're you're weathering the storms. The simplest one we talked about before, which is on good years, just take out more than whatever your withdrawal rate is so that on bad years, That money is just, maybe it's in a bond. Maybe it's in a high yield savings account. Maybe it's in something else, but you can withdraw that and leave your actual principal alone, right? Um, But finally, that leads me into our our secret, right? Our uh, preview. Yep. Do you want to hit it off? Yeah, I'll I'll start it. So uh, you texted me, I don't know, you want to call it Monday? No, it's last... Thursday? Last Friday? Yeah. Something Let's like that. Let's call Friday. So it's like we'll a call, week ago. Yeah, we'll call yeah. it last Friday. You sent me a text message. I was at work. I uh, got out and checked my phone, and it said, <laughs> hey, I have a really stupid or really great idea to talk to you about. <laughs> I don't know which one it is. So um, and just so you, all of you watching know, when I see that text message from uh, AJ, it gets me excited because usually it's a really good idea. So I'll give him a lot of credit <laughs> on this one. So one day he's going to have a stupid one, and I'll share it on here when he does. Uh But, you know, he talked about an idea and he's like, hey, I've been researching how IUL companies make money and why this product's appealing. And I think I can recreate it myself for almost free in Mm -hmm. in essence. So we started doing some research. He threw together this really elaborate uh, spreadsheet and I threw together a slightly less elaborate one because he's a software (laughs) developer and I just have an MBA. So mine's not quite as good, but just... um, just but we uh we created (laughs) spreadsheets completely independent of each other and they roughly say the exact same thing so uh we've kind of hammered this out and we have a really good uh idea that we're going to share with you guys again it's not financial advice but it is just another theory along this big landscape of uh personal finance that we call life 
So, oh, definitely. And I'll give you a preview because I've been talking about this recently. Is that um, you can take loans out against your taxable brokerage account, right? We talked about earlier. I've been talking about it with all this IUL stuff. You can take loans out against your taxable brokerage account. And what we sat down, and I'm not going to give all the mechanics. We'll talk about that later. But when we sat down and looked at it, we figured out that on average, and this is on average, the market goes up at a faster rate than most of these loan interest rates, which isn't like an incredibly, you know, new thing. Mm -hmm. The idea is, you know, like we do that with real estate, right? Like we're, we're take we're leveraging that stuff out. We had a really low interest rate. We're making money. Like, you know, this whole leverage concept isn't really necessarily a new thing. It's just that when we sat down and looked at the averages, we could see how impactful it was to with like instead of withdrawing from your index funds, selling them and taking the tax hit, you essentially just take out loans against them called SB locks, security backed lines of credit or asset backed lines of credit. And we've talked about those a few times on this channel, but there's something interesting that we found out about them. We will release or we will tell you guys what that is at some point. So make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss out. We're also giving away $500 to somebody who's one of our first 10,000 subscribers. So you're going to want to subscribe if just for that. Just to get 500 bucks. Definitely. Who doesn't want that? That's free, right? So, so subscribing is free, and $500 is an infinite return on it, that subscribe investment, right? You can't beat that. That's that's no. the best thing you can that's, do. That's completely Then 401k money. with match, then Roth IRA. That's how it goes, right? And we'll give the information. We've done some numbers on this, on this strategy, and we figured out that in extreme recessions like 2008, some of the strategy gets blown up, which is why we're being careful not to, like – you know, totally tell everyone to go out and do this. So we'll have to like get the numbers right. Um, we'll have to get the language right. So we don't get sued by somebody who tries this and ruins their life. So we'll get Fact. there and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll explain what we're talking about. Any yeah, last words? No, uh, you yeah, know, just that's what we're here for. So, you know, we're not telling you how to invest your money. What we're telling you is, uh, you know, there's a lot of value and good research and there are hundreds mm -hmm. of ways to do this. So, you know, so when you hear a really good sales pitch, just be skeptical of it. If it sounds really, really good and it, it sounds like you can make a ton of money, eh, that might be too good to be true. So just make sure you're doing your due diligence. Anytime you're going to spend your hard-earned money on any kind of investment product, just make sure you know what you're getting into. Absolutely. Like if you could sit down, like, you, you know, I would say the baseline is this. Compounding interest is a fairly easy concept but people have a hard time wrapping their brain around it. If you go to wealthyidiots.com, I'll, I'll add the, the link down below. We have a compound interest calculator. All it does is it just adds that interest every year, a little bit more, a little bit more. And as your, as your item's growing, you're getting that much more return every year on average, right? On average, again, not every year, but on average. Um, if someone is if you're incapable of wrapping your head around how that would work with anything, then you need more information about that thing, right? That's plain and simple. So if you can't sit down by yourself and put something into a spreadsheet on your own, don't, don't put your money into it, right? Index funds, real easy to calculate real estate, much harder, right? So once you understand and how to, how to do the real estate calculations, maybe now you're ready to talk about real estate, right? And it's, it turns out index and whole life even harder, not necessarily because I can't get, um, like, cause I can't do the math. It's because I can't get the data. It's like nearly impossible to get the data. You get these illustrations and even the illustrations are like fuzzy. You have they to go are. all over the place to find this stuff, which is why I kind of picked apart that CPA episode. So if you can't put the stuff into a spreadsheet, it's probably either, you know, it's too complicated. You're probably getting scammed somehow or, there's just hidden stuff you're just not ready for. And like that guy in the court case, you don't want to be in a position where you owe 55 K a year when you only make 60 K a year. And that's easy to do because Bingo. a lot of people don't know about this stuff. So yep. yeah, that's it. I'll get off my high horse. <laughs> hey, that's what we're here for. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's yep. the whole point. Right. And so to wrap it back down to the beginning and then I'll close out is this. We created a community with each other to try and bounce these ideas off each other and to try and get better at this because it really is needed. Like, I don't think that I'd be where I am today if it wasn't for DC and vice versa, right? He talks to me about real estate. I talk to him about index funds. We talk about growth generally. We bounce ideas off of each other in order to try and be as successful as possible. Um, this, you know, wealthy idiots, it, this is the community. 
right? Yep. So following, subscribing, getting on our webpage, we're not selling you anything. All you got to do is be a part of the community so that you can learn and grow like us and be a part of this so that we can all learn and grow together and share information so that we're all doing the best that we possibly can. Yep. And all I'll right, leave you it. one... I'll leave you with one final thought. Um, you know, what you're talking about, it does require you to kind of lose the fear of talking about money. So if you can't talk about money and you can't have conversations with people, all of this shuts down and gets hard. So just keep in mind, you know, it does require some self-reflection. And it does require some disclosure of, you know, what you want to do, what your goals are, um, and how you want to get there financially. So, hey, we need to normalize talking about money. It needs to be an everyday thing, and that's how we all get better. Amen. I love it. Well, thanks, DC, for stopping by. I super appreciate it. Thanks for everyone in the audience for stopping by. Hit WealthyIdiots.com. Make sure you like and subscribe, and we will see you guys next time. Thanks, guys.